Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome. Excited to have you here today with us. Uh, we have Mike Lightman on this webinar, and today we'll be talking about VC funding, building pitch decks that pitch decks that helps you to raise funding and looking taking a look at the overall landscape uh, for startups in 2023. So while we're waiting for more people to join. Um, just a couple words about who we are and what we're doing here. Uh, my name is Lena Levine, and uh, I'm the founder of a digital product agency called Fricota. And uh, um, I started this series of webinars uh, with a mission to provide a ton of value for entrepreneurs, for startup founders that are uh, maybe just starting their journey, uh, entrepreneurs that have already been doing it for a while, and um, just help to bring uh, amazing speakers, amazing industry knowledge to all of you over. Um, I, I've been in the industry for over a decade now, and I've seen all sorts of horror stories from startup founders that got burned, that went into the wrong direction. So uh, I'm on a mission now to provide the value, provide the knowledge. So my, myself and all our guest speakers can help you to avoid the mistakes um, as you navigate in the startup world. So, well, with that said, I would like to welcome our guest speaker, Mike Lightman today. And uh, uh, a few words about Mike. Mike is an entrepreneur. Uh, he's a venture capitalist, mentor, advisor, and ecosystem builder. Mike previously served as the managing partner of Big ID Ventures, which is a $50 million fund focused on alternative protein foods. He spent a few years with the World uh, Bank's InfoDev program, designing and rolling out startup programs around the world. He also ran the Urban Future Lab, a New York City-based clean tech incubator. Mike's programs and direct support have, have helped hundreds of startups raise hundreds of millions of dollars and hire hundreds of employees. Mike started his career as a Peace Corps volunteer in Morocco, where he focused on small business development. He earned, he earned an MBA from the University of Rochester and the Bachelor's of Business Administration from James Madison University. Mike currently runs Hate Your Deck, a storytelling agency for great founders who have amazing businesses but struggle with fundraising or just getting their story out there. His services have been used by startups, CPG products, agencies, and even restaurants. And I also know Mike has recently launched uh, his course that's also aimed at startup founders that are looking to learn how to put together better pitch decks. So welcome, Mike. Excited to have you here. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm pretty sure that I took my terrible bio and ran it through ChatGPT and that you just <laughs> read uh, an AI-powered bio of me. Oh, I did a pretty good job. Yeah, I think so. I sound way better than I actually am when, when you say it out loud like that. Did, did you run the command to make me look good? <laughs> yeah, make me sound more impressive than I am. I had to run it a couple of times. Nice. nice. Awesome. Well, Mike, um, so I what I wanted to start with, right, we just, you know, crossed the 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 new year line when officially in 2023. So uh, I'm sure a lot of entrepreneurs out there, the startup founders, are putting together the plans how they're going to navigate this year whether they just building their startup looking to fundraise um i just read the report by pitch deck uh with their uh forecast for 2023 fundraising landscape and they what they forecast in is that vcs uh will be shifting their focus and funding uh dollars from late stage startups and uh putting their focus on early stage startups so it sounds like uh recently forecast 2023 is still going to be a pretty good year for um early stage companies even though we might be seeing um lower valuations and uh tighter tighter requirements for startups uh but yeah i wanted to to ask your feedback what you know what you're seeing um you know with your experience um in, in that let's landscape how do you think um you know 2023 will look for startup founders? I think I kind of have three disparate thoughts on either, you know, and I want to, I want to temper my answer instead of saying, this is what the landscape will look like, because I don't think I'm smart enough for that. I'll say, this is what I'm excited for or things that I've heard. Um, so I think the first one is exactly like, yeah, there's going to be more investment in early stage companies. And to your point, um, what I'm hearing is that people are getting lower valuations and they, their money has to last longer. 
Um, as far as deployment of capital, when we go into a recession, which is what everybody says we're about to walk into, if we aren't already in it, um, there's generally, I would say, whenever I chat with my investor friends, I hear a mix um, around, are you deploying capital into new companies? Some of them say yes, some of them say no, and some of them say we're only reinvesting in our existing and like doing follow on investments into our invest that uh, existing rounds. So I think kind of a takeaway for me for entrepreneurs is the number game is even more important than it was before. Can you hear that? Give me one moment, please. I have a two year old who has decided to be right outside of this room. Right, while we're waiting for Mike to return, if you have any questions, feel free to um, add them to the Q&A chat and we will take a look at them at the end of this um, discussion. Welcome back. Sorry, two-year-old is uh, relocating shortly. Um, so that's <laughs> kind of insight number Fine. two. Insight mm -hmm. number three is kind of like, what are the trends that are gonna be interesting in 2023? Or at least what are the trends that I'm interested in 2023? One of them is a favorite of mine, and I definitely see it increasing, especially during um, downturns. I call it kind of apocalypse tech, which is anything that is around resiliency. So climate tech, water, energy production, food, CPG, um, and then anything aerospace or getting into space and mining asteroids or just traveling. Um, I think there's another trend that's definitely been increasing that isn't going to go away, which is anything that's gonna, I would say, level the playing field for any um, disenfranchised group. So that could be based off economic class, that could be based off of ethnic background, that could be based off of any combination. But anything that kind of helps people kind of, again, level the playing field is another really big one. And then another trend that I'm excited for, and I think I'm beginning to see an increase in it, is alternative forms of investment. So uh, one side of this is, kind of unlocking investment categories that normally only the rich have. So that could be things like inventory financing or a little bit of the ventures, like what crowdfunding has been around forever, but um, asset classes that normally the average person wouldn't have access to. And the other one is, um, despite the fact that I've been living in the world of venture capital, it is extremely expensive for founders. Um, and most VCs are nervous about erring away from kind of all the things that are normal. So your safe notes, your convertibles, your standard equity. But we're beginning to see a shift into folks that are not looking for the unicorns, but looking for the above average businesses that can spit out returns. And we're seeing investment categories that will do kind of a revenue share or even investing in the founder themselves instead of the company in the hopes of like, we believe that you will be successful regardless of whatever your company is. So that's another trend that I, I would say, I'm really excited to see grow in 2023. Awesome, and that's a great point that you that you just made. And that's something that we, I always, um, you know, tell the founders that we work with or just, you know, trying to spread that message out there with, you know, uh, especially the first time entrepreneurs or like non-technical founders is that, you have to put the homework, right? When you go to present the investors your idea, your project, you you can't just show them the pitch deck, and which is still very important, right? But you can't just show up with your idea and ask them, you know, give me money because I have, you know, and enter all the relevant buzzwords uh, and expect that the invest investor is going to throw money at you, which kind of happened with the um, Web3 industry and the, you know, all the crypto startups that now, um, I, I don't hear anything <laughs> about those anymore, except the only bad news. But um, putting together that legwork, doing the research, putting together, you know, whether it's a prototype or MVP before and getting traction, ideally having some sort of, you know, pre-sales commitment from the clients, that's going to be essential for entrepreneurs uh, for, you know, going out and raising, raising the uh, funding from the investors. And I think what's going to, um, one of the reasons I'm also, I guess, n n n I wouldn't say excited, but I think the good things that will come out out of this year is that the startups that have been uh, bloated with, you know, just uh, over hiring resources and just, um, you know, focusing on the wrong things rather than like going lean and trying to, you know, get as far as possible with the resources that they have. I think the, you know, this year we're going to see the survival of the fittest and uh, that will leave the strongest and the best companies on the market. 
which is also terrifying um, just with the amount of layoffs and what's right, going yeah. to happen with the incredible talent. So I, I agree. I think it's really interesting because I think the last couple of years, there's been just a tremendous amount of money going into companies. And now those companies are getting their purse strings tightened and we're seeing the effects of some of that, which is good for equilibrium, but scary for all of our friends that will be job hunting. Right. Or they can become the first time founders as well. So you never know. Or launch their own companies. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So it, it can go both ways. So, um, all righty. Well, and, um, um, since we're talking about the investments, what, um, you know, as entrepreneurs approach the investors and let's say they're looking to raise their first seed round, what should they keep in mind as they navigate these unfamiliar waters? What's normally happening behind the scenes in the investor's mind that startup founders should be aware of? So I have a lot to say on this, but can I start? Is there a way for me to ask the audience a question? Yeah. Yeah, and we have a Q&A people can respond there, I believe, with the... Uh, I think the answers. first thing that I would want to know from the audience is how many of you know how venture capital works from a mechanical end? Like how funds are structured and all of the back end of the investors they're going at? It's my follow on question was how many people know how to use the Q&A function? I'm going to create a quick poll. I've never done this before. So let me, uh, let me, uh, no, okay, let me, okay. I just created a quick poll. Okay, if, um, people can answer yes or no there. Okay, so we're getting some answers in the Q&A. Sorry, I'm throwing a curveball at everybody here. I'll tell you what, while everybody's answering, um, yeah, I think the I want to start there because in the same way that all of us that have our startups probably know our industry and probably know our customers really well, which is why we've probably been angry at something and created a solution to address it. And we know how to settle our customers. The VCs of the world and the angel investors and everybody else, they're our customers when we're fundraising. And if we don't understand what motivates them and how they work, we're already at a disadvantage. So I'm gonna kind of give a quick high level run through just so we understand what is the incentive and kind of where is the investor's mind when they're meeting with you. So first of all, most venture capital funds follow this model, which is called two and 20. And the, like, the very quick version is, these VCs are raising money from other people the same way that startups are raising money from VCs. Most investors only put about 1% of the total amount into their venture fund. So if I have a hundred million dollar venture fund, my team's commitment to it is 1 million and I get 99 million from foundations and I don't know, like all the different groups, family offices, whatever else is there. My venture fund has a shelf life of 10 years. So it starts year one and literally shuts down at year 10. During that time, I want to throw a lot of darts for the first three years or so, three to five years, and put a little bit of money into a lot of companies that I think are really compelling. And then I want to look at the companies that are doing best and provide more money into my winners during the remainder of that fund. Whenever I get an exit, what I have to do is I pay back my investors 100% of what I've given them, which is probably obvious. And then for every extra dollar that I get, I have to give them 80 cents and I keep 20 cents, which means that I need to get a lot of money back for this to be worthwhile for me. Um, most venture funds also only get 2% of the total fund amount to cover their operations every year. So again, if I have a $100 million venture fund, that means my annual budget is 2 million. And because we're seeing a lot of micro venture funds or kind of smaller funds that are maybe 10 or $20 million, we're looking at closer to a hundred thousand or two hundred thousand dollars of operations, which means that you only have one or two people working at the fund doing everything. So, kind of what you what I hope you take away from what I'm explaining now is that VCs they have to get massive returns to make it worthwhile, and they have to show massive returns because they need to then get their additional fund. They aren't going to begin fundraising for it in year nine. They're probably going to begin fundraising in years three and four so they can have multiple funds. 
Number two is there's a good chance that the people that you're talking to are juggling multiple jobs. Most of them are probably looking at 100 plus deals per month. They're emotionally exhausted, they're overworked, and they're really doing it for kind of the love of what they do as opposed to being independently wealthy and just doing it as a hobby. So you're already walking in at a disadvantage where the VC is saying, I need to see you, like, I probably love who you are and what you're doing, but I need you to very quickly get to the point of this is how much money you're gonna make my fund and do it in a way that basically requires me not having to work a lot. Cause I'm gonna give you five or 10 minutes of my attention to read this deck. And if you don't explain to me what I need, then I'm out. So that's kind of like the foundation of where we're walking in. And with my course, I actually set up a little bingo board and I like to have um, everybody in it where we'll actually play the role of the investor and tear decks apart. And I think, when I then jump forward into like, why is this so hard and what's happening? And you know, I think there's kind of three layers of going in front of an investor and fundraising. The first one, or I'll work backwards. The very end of it, which is kind of easy, is what is the risk of this company and what is the reward? So how much money could this company make for my investment fund? And what is the likelihood of that happening? Um, and generally at that point, it's like, I know it falls within my thesis, I'm running a little bit of math. I'm kind of licking my finger, sticking it to the air, talking to potential customers, and I know whether I want to talk to you or not. Kind of to get to that, the investors are looking at six different criteria. What is the pain in the market? What is the product market fit? What is the market size? What is the competitive advantage? Who is the team and why are they incredible? And then kind of what's the deal? How much money are you raising? What is the equity I'm going to get? Kind of the math behind that. And I would say... By the time you get to that point and the risk and return point, it's pretty clear if the investor is going to be a good fit for you. And that's more of like spending a little bit of time together, making sure it's a fit and conducting due diligence. I want to say 95, and this is a stat that I'm making up, 95%, but it's probably not inaccurate, of 95% of deals don't make it to that because investors have no idea what the company does. And part of what we've done at Hate Your Deck is I'll take somebody's fundraise deck, I'll bring in a guest VC who is a potential fit for that company. And without the founder being there on video, we'll just do a deck review. And we'll send all of the feedback to the, to the founder, kind of with the idea of being like, this is what you think you're saying, this is what your customer's seeing um, to kind of do that overlap there. Um, and I would say most of the time by 10 minutes in, there comes a point when every investor says, this is the point at which I would throw the deck away. Um, mm -hmm. And realistically, we're taking way longer to go through it. So most of them say, I would have thrown this out by 30 seconds or a minute into this. And it's not because the company is bad. It's not because they don't fit those six pieces. It's because the investor saying, I'm emotionally drained. You're telling me the wrong story. I don't care about your origin story. I don't care about how you're giving back to the world. Like, or like, I don't even know what you do yet, or you spent 10 slides telling me what you do, or I have no idea if you're pre-revenue or if you're making millions of dollars. Like you're just not giving me the key facts that I need to be able to, the facts and the story of your company to interpret what's going on. So I think to, um, to try and succinctly answer your very simple question, I think one of the, one of the biggest issues around fundraising and deck building and going in front of investors, it actually isn't, is my company good or bad? It's, am I telling my story almost the way that a children's book is written so that the investor can read it within 30 seconds or a minute, understand what my company is and decide whether they want to have a longer conversation with me. So you're saying use as simple language as possible. So even a five-year-old can understand. Use simple language, don't use jargon, but even then like, I like to have two paths in the decks that we build. There's the one, which is the one or two sentences on the front of every slide, where literally if you only read that, it would be like a kid's book. Like, you know, the industry is cybersecurity is really dangerous today. And the problem is why? Because computers are evolving faster than we can write code for it or hackers are hacking. What is a solution? What if quantum computing, this like imaginary, not imaginary, this like incredibly fast, powerful thing was able to use AI to go in and fix it? What, what have we accomplished so far? We've proven it, blah, blah, blah. 
you know, where are we going? We're raising money to continue to grow the company. And then at the bottom of every slide, or like the lower half of every slide, you have pieces that corroborate that. So you talk about the cybersecurity, here's some stats that link to directly what I said. The problem is this, here's some sort of evidence around it. So the investor can get the quick and you know, like kids book version that is simple, that is easily digestible, that if you were trapped in an elevator for 30 seconds, you could just repeat that and people get it. And then you have the longer version for the VC who wants to go a little bit deeper or who's intrigued and now wants to do another pass of your deck to decide if they really want to have a conversation with you. Awesome. That's great. So, and um, uh, what do you see, um, like, if we're looking at two, you know, let's say two companies that are, you know, uh, the founders that are maybe, let's say they're pretty much similar between like the products and like how they present their product, like what would be the, uh, maybe like a key decision-making point for investor to, you know, pick one company over another? I think it will always, if you're comparing apples to apples, I think mm -hmm. the deciding factor is always going to be the team. Um, okay. And there's a lot of ways to think about that, but I almost simplify it to like that. If you have anybody that you haven't seen, like a childhood friend that you haven't seen in years and you bump into them I don't know, at a grocery store or a bar and you're catching up and that person is like, oh yeah, I launched a company. I'm incredibly successful. And I just bought a private island. And in the back of your head, you're like, well, of course you did because you're incredible. And I've always known that you're gonna be successful. Like you wanna be able to portray that and kind of thinking about what do people often do and what is it that I'm looking for? What I very often see with the deck is somebody saying, we have a combined 140 years of experience or you know, I worked at the following big name organizations. Here's a bunch of logos, here's where I went to college and this is the amount of years of experience that I have. And like, let me ask you, if if I just met you and one of my first questions was, how old are you? What would be your reaction? I'd be like, you don't ask, don't ask the lady that question. How dare you? <laughs> but we put that right in the deck, right? Like if you tell me how many years of experience you have, I know how old you are. You're not telling me about your, like what I want to know is not just how old you are, but I want to know what are the successes that you've had that are indicative of your ability to execute in the future. And really, I want to understand more about what have you done in the past in the industry in which you operate and ideally overlap with the success. And I want to know what have you done in the past that overlaps with the role that you have at this company. If you're a CEO, you're probably going to be doing fundraising and investor relationships. What have you done in the past that has overlap with that? If you're a programmer, Tell me about your development. Tell me about the teams that you've led in doing these things and the successes that you've had. And I wanna know more, almost like the resume stats where you can throw in any kind of math that's impressive as opposed to the just like, yeah, uh, I'm old. This is how old I am, like you should invest in me. And I went to college and, and here's a logo of one of the companies that I was at. Um, so I think that like kind of the, the split answer is it's the team that's going to be the differentiating factor. And then going deeper in, this is how I would recommend explaining the accolades of the team to really make sure that you stand out of that first glimpse. That's that's a great point. So I one of the follow up questions that I have to that. So um, a lot of entrepreneurs that you know we work with and you know who I meet in general, um, let's say especially non technical founders that are coming from not uh, you know non technical fields and uh, how. Do you have any recommendations for them? How can they assemble the team to, you know, position themselves, position themselves stronger in front of the investors? Because I'm sure some people will have that question. How do I assemble the team? How do I find those right partners, right people that will make me more successful? So are you talking specifically about co-founders? Like if you're a solo founder and you're technical and you're looking for the business half or vice versa, are you talking about bringing in the rest of the team that's going to be doing all the pulling of levers and pushing of buttons? I would say the anyone who would help, uh, you know, anyone on the team who would help to uh, secure that first round of funding for the uh, for the founder. It could be co-founder. Finding co-founders, especially technical co-founders, can be challenging. So, um, like our clients, for example, they bring us on board, right? So we help them with, you know, to design, develop their products. Uh, but like, if they're looking to bring maybe, 
you know, like a CFO, CTO on board? How do they navigate this area? So again, I'm going to give you more words than I should to answer this. Just cut me off when I'm rambling. Um, as from an investor perspective, I care about the people that are driving the strategy, creating the vision, driving the strategy, and overseeing execution. So that's going to be the C-suite of the team. If you are raising your first round, my expectation is that there's probably going to be two or three people. There's going to be the technical side, the business side, and maybe like an additional person focusing on business development and sales. Um, as your friend, I am excited about who else you bring on, who's going to be doing customer success and sales and programmers and everything else. From a professional end, I couldn't care less. If this is somebody that could be fired and replaced um, that will do the exact same job, don't include them. Don't tell me about them. That is for later on. From uh, like, I will kind of pick at the specific examples that you shared. Um, I will not want to see a CFO in a first raise. I will not want to see legal in a first raise. Very often, these are things that you can hire. Like, you'll hire an accounting firm. You'll hire a legal firm. Um, but if you're spending time and effort on recruiting people, especially to be full time for that, that's a flag for me um, because that is not what your priority should be. But going into really the guts of your question, which is like, where do you find the people that can help you with the brainstorming and the strategy and all of that? Um, I think organizations like yours um, can definitely, definitely, definitely help with the technical side of things um, because finding trustworthy and reliable technical co-founders is exceedingly hard. Obviously, you know this because of the business that you're in. Right, yeah. Um, but, but finding the people that are actually good, that are going to be committed, that are willing to work either with sweat or for low salaries and stay at it, that's like a needle in a needle stack. Um, I think from the business end, I have yet to find a really good spot where you can find them. I think for me, it's a matter of flagging to your network. Um, and going into LinkedIn or Facebook or whatever it is that you use, TikTok, and sharing what you're up to and looking for people that are passionate about it, doing some sort of a trial with them and going from there. But um, I know that there are a lot of groups that are matchmaking around this, but I have, this is me, I have yet to see any real big success stories come from them. Interesting. What about advisors? Should uh, founders have advisors uh, in their pitch decks listed? I don't care about your advice. I'll put it this way. If your advisor is unlocking doors and like you can actively say, I got this deal because of this advisor. I got access to something that I wouldn't have had without them because of them. And you need to understand that I'm punching above my weight class only because of these people include them. If you're collecting them like Pokemon and you're like, well, the investor wants to see advisor. So I should probably put them in. Definitely do not do that. Um, do I also would say don't list a lot of early stage incubator and accelerator programs or like grants are great, but like government agencies that are funding grants, I would say are a flag that and like multiple incubators or accelerators are oftentimes a flag for me of a first time founder, which is just unfortunately a checkbox in the risk side of things. Interesting. Okay. Kind of the counter counterintuitive actually. So okay, that's that's a great um, piece of information. So um, let's see. So I know we kind of uh, we, we're approaching the top of our um, thirty minutes. So um, if uh, if the audience have any specific questions, feel free to drop them in the Q and A section so we can cover them. Um, Let's see, Mike, is there anything else that you would like to add um, that I haven't asked you about? I don't think so. I'm afraid that I've already given a wall of information. So I want to avoid talking more now just to throw people off. Um, I can answer the first question I see on here, which is from Clark, if you'd like. Sure, yeah. Um, Clark, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna have a great answer for you, but the question is what kind of interest rates are you seeing on convertible notes now that the Fed has raised the rate so significantly? Um, again, I'll give you two answers. The one answer is I'm not seeing a difference. I'm not seeing a lot of convertible notes day to day, but my, my intuition and my reaction would tell me that it isn't that big of a difference because, and I'm sure that you know this, um, in fact, you probably know this more intimately than I do, 
but most investors that are doing convertible notes aren't doing it for the interest rate. Um, and very oftentimes aren't even gonna call it in and are just planning on converting. Um, so I like it's it's a concession and it's an easy point of negotiation. So my guess is going to be that most convertible notes are staying more or less the same because the end game isn't gonna be the interest rate. That's just like a throwing a bone for the investor. Awesome. Um, I see another question from Andre. Um, who can help us build our elevator speech? Happy to give you my email right. um, or you'll probably and, get it at the end. And Yeah, with that said, let me share my screen with our contact information so that way you guys can. Uh, let's see. We can, yep, here. Um, can, um, can everybody see this? So yeah, I just... Um, Here's uh, Mike's and my contact information in case you want to reach out to us with questions. So um, let's see, oops. Okay, the other question, what ratio of convertibles uh, to saves are you seeing? I almost feel like it's a West Coast versus East Coast thing. Um, the West Coast companies are all doing saves and I'm still seeing a healthy number of convertibles on the East Coast, but I would say, I see more safes than I see convertibles. Again, not answer, not answer, or not answer, answer. But broadly speaking, I don't think anybody really has strong opinions on them. And most, uh, the safe is founder friendlier and most investors are more willing to say, like, I'm willing to work with you. And this is a sign of me wanting to work with you by giving you the safe. And then, Hi, I'm Padma. How important is it to put business projections in the first round of pitch or pitch deck? Um, hi, Padma. It's important. Um, I want to see ballpark. And really what I want to know, it's kind of twofold for me. Part of it is gaming the system and part of it is genuine. I don't really expect to see the hockey stick growth. Um, because that's unrealistic. But what I want to understand is that you understand your financials. And we're both kind of laughing behind the scenes because really what you're doing is this. And what I'm doing is the same thing. But I want to understand the logic behind it. And I want to know the logic. I want to know that you know the logic behind your revenue as well. So do you understand and can you share with me or give me an indication that you have a strong understanding behind what is your business model? What will your business model continue to be? What is your market? What is your go-to-market? And then are those numbers actually tying in with the strategy that you're projecting to me and going into your financial projections? And kind of flags that I'm looking for are gonna be, do you kind of have a bunch of hand waving over here and then your numbers are completely ridiculous? Um, so I think it's really important to show me that you have thought about this and that you have a strategy in place that can guide where your financials will go. Awesome. And then uh, um, Andre is asking, recession or not yet, and we see climate now? Question mark. Um, I'm not entirely sure I understand the question, but I think uh, if I'm reading it correctly. Yeah, he's probably wondering if you, if, if you think we're in the recession or not yet, and what the VC climate looks like now. I I think that we might be in the place where like six months from now we'll look back and be like we are in the recession. But I don't I don't think we're in it yet. But we'll see kind of how things pan out. Um, I mean, for the VC climate now, one of my I mean I was a I'm a nerd. I was a Peace Corps volunteer. I did climate related things as a Peace Corps volunteer. My first job in like outside of MBA college was running a climate tech focused incubator um, before people thought it was fun and interesting. And a lot of my professional career has been in climate tech. So I'm gonna just say yes, um, always climate tech. All righty, any, any final questions, thoughts before we wrap it up? So please feel free to reach out to Mike and myself. So uh, Mike, you also have oh, just a quick plug. You also launched the course for uh, uh, for, for Pitch Deck, right? And correct. Yes. Um, so we at Hate Your Deck will do a lot of the bespoke building for you. But 
I have found that there's so much more that you can get from learning how to go through it and learning some of the techniques. So in the course, um, it's relatively short um, by intention. We've got two lectures, two workshops and office hours. We'll go deeper into this is how VCs think. We'll go into here's how you can convert your origin story, which your founder or your investor doesn't care about just yet and turn it into your deck story. And then we'll do it together. We'll build it. We'll give each other feedback. And then kind of in the same way that the first time you do your homework for college or high school, um, it's probably not like the best you've ever done. That's when we'll sit down with you one on one to get it to where it needs to be. So you walk away with usable deck content. Um, and yeah, I'm a huge fan of it so far. We've launched it and done it, taught it to about 60, 70 people and feedback has been great. So I'd love to share more info on that for anybody that's interested. And yeah, thank you all for joining. This is awesome. Thank you for having me. I hope I didn't talk thank you. too much. No, no, this was great. So, well, thank you, everybody. We'll be sharing. Uh, you'll receive the link to this recording if you want to rewatch it. Uh, shoot a message to myself or Mike if you have questions about building pitch decks or designing building software. So we're here to um, help and support you and make sure that you're successful. So, uh, well, with that said, uh, we're going to wrap it up. Have a great day, everybody, and uh, we'll see you soon. Bye-bye. See you, everyone.